Buongiorno, benvenuti a bordo del Yanarco Express 32, 73 il treno arriverà a Roma Termini. I've spent most of my career studying Paul and his influence on Christianity. Now, I'm turning to Peter. I'm traveling to the land where his formation from humble fisherman to the Bishop of Rome took place. And I'm discovering for myself the places he influenced. We could say that these are the arms of Peter embracing all people, following his path of most unlikely transformation. I'm Con Campbell and I'm in pursuit of Peter. I'm on my way to Rome, Roma, the eternal city. And this is my last stop in pursuit of Peter because it was his last stop before going to his eternal home. It's not the most glamorous shot of it right here, but it gets better. Of course, Peter would have walked to Rome, but the train suits me just fine. Peter lived and taught here for as many as 15 years. The churches here must have been excited to be with Peter, an eyewitness of Jesus' life. If I were a Christian living in Rome during that first century, I'd certainly be excited for this apostle to come to town. To hear first-hand accounts of the teachings and actions of Jesus would have given the believers here renewed faith. Hearing the stories about what Jesus said, about the miracles, and of course, to hear first-hand Peter's account of Jesus' death and resurrection. I like this place. No, I really like this place. Domed cathedrals surrounded by buildings that form a mosaic of colors, interrupted with iconic structures like the Pantheon and the Colosseum. I love the arching old bridges spanning the Tiber River and all the plazas that invite gathering, among other things. I mean, he's better than me, but he didn't seem that good. Okay, enough of this. I have a dinner date. I joined my friends Corrado and Phoebe Primavera. Names that sound like they belong to an Italian menu. Are you hungry? Yeah. I am hungry. I'm always hungry. <laughs> Shortly we will be ready. Excellent. And we will taste if it's good or not. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just pick up. From your garden. Lovely. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Corrado has the heart of a shepherd like Peter. He's a pastor in Rome, teaching about Jesus and his kingdom to the local believers. I think that's similar to why Peter came here, to encourage the followers of Jesus. It's interesting, you know, as a Protestant myself, that we, we tend to favor Paul. The perception is Peter belongs to the Catholic Church. Yeah. We tend to neglect Peter, I think. Yeah. I know I have, but Peter belongs to everyone, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, he belongs to us all. To me, Peter is a beautiful disciple. With Peter, you can identify, right. you know, yeah. he, he was impulsive. You can relate and, to uh, him. And, and we always make, you know, impulsive decisions. Yeah. And he made mistakes, we make mistakes. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it's easier probably to identify with yeah. Peter. Yeah, I, I've certainly found that to be the case. In fact, I've found that with Peter, the more I've followed him, the more I feel an affinity with him because yeah. he's a very relatable human, but I think what's great about all that was achieved through Peter is it shows you that God can do yeah. amazing things through yeah. ordinary yeah. people who make yeah. mistakes. Will oh. you like to taste? Oh, oh yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Tell me it's hot because I use a lot of chili. Mm. That's very nice. Mm? You need to eat. Okay. Okay. Mangiate, right. mangiate. <laughs> Buon appetito. Okay. Good, good. What do you think of Peter? Ah, I'm uh, I'm very close to him yeah. because I'm impulsive. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Really. 
By the time Peter made it to Rome, it had been about 30 years since he first met Jesus. And so much had changed. What began so small as a Jewish religious movement in Jerusalem had spread across the empire all the way to its heart. But despite, or, or maybe because of its growth, these Christians were being looked at with increasing suspicion. They were a bit too weird. Roman culture had two prerequisites for fitting in. Worship any, or many, gods for fertility, rain, wine, everything. And second, worshiping the emperor as a god. What's interesting is he's in Rome, he's very aware of what kind of emperor Nero is. And at this stage, he's become nasty. He wasn't initially troublesome to Christians, but he became so around about AD 64 when he blamed the great fire in Rome on Christians. After that point, that was kind of a turning point where he kind of more aggressively became anti-Christian. And Peter is around for that. He sees that. And yet, in chapter 2 of his first letter, he says, submit to the emperor. This is an astonishing thing to say. Submit to the emperor. Now, you have to think about that because he's describing believers as aliens and strangers in the world. They don't belong to this world. This is not their true home. This is not where their allegiance is. So it'd be easy for Christians to say, so I can just ignore the emperor. I can ignore the rules. I can ignore human laws. And many Christians have kind of gone in that direction throughout history. But it's a mistake because Peter says, live as aliens and strangers, but submit to the authorities that God has placed over you, including the emperor. And who is that emperor? One of the worst emperors who ever lived, a much more tyrannical ruler than any Western Christian has ever known. And he says, submit to him. If it means you're going to suffer for it, unjustly, then do it as Christ did. It's not like Peter was trying to get arrested or killed. He simply wanted to continue what Jesus told him to do, teaching, pastoring, and mentoring believers throughout the empire. And it's likely that during this time, Peter wrote the two letters in the Bible that bear his name. These were his first and last written words the words of a devoted shepherd. An ancient bridge that dates to the golden age of Rome still spans the Tiber River. It's called St. Angel's Bridge. It now stands as a monument to Jesus' death. Ten angels line the walk. Each one holds an element of the crucifixion of Jesus. According to tradition, Peter was crucified by Emperor Nero. But we're told that Peter asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Peter wasn't the only disciple to be put to death for teaching about Jesus. All but one met a martyr's death, and all of them followed Christ to the end. The Basilica of St. John seeks to honor their faith appropriately. For these 12 followers, Jesus' statement was clear. If anyone wants to follow me, they must take up their cross. Peter wrote to others who were suffering too. He said, After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, the one who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, empower, strengthen, and establish you. 
He humbled himself. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He didn't strike back at those who oppressed him and persecuted him. He is a model for other believers that they look up to him, they're influenced by him. He encourages them in the walk because he's been through it all and he wants to help others get through it as well. No city on earth celebrates Peter's life and memorializes his death as much as Rome. And no place in Rome celebrates Peter as much as the famous church, appropriately named, St. Peter's Basilica. There are many who can explain the history and design of St. Peter's, but few are both as knowledgeable and passionate about this place as Dr. Elizabeth Lev. We met in the colonnades that frame St. Peter's Square, which by the way, is one of those round squares. So Liz, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that Peter was put to death by Emperor Nero. And 2000 years later, it's Peter who is adored and revered and has a place like this built in his honor. As far as I know, no one really adores Nero anymore. I assume there isn't, but is there anywhere in Rome that approximates anything like this built in honor of Nero. When it comes down to physical structures in the city of Rome that remind you of Nero, we have very little. Mm -hmm. An underground spot that's always broken down, another underground spot that no one can go visit, but really a dark underground stronghold. Whereas look at this building, St. Peter's Basilica, that takes all this light. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate irony of this whole affair is that at the end of the day, Nero caused the execution of St. Peter out of a real estate deal. In yeah. 64 AD, a fire went up in the city of Rome that took out 10 of the 14 neighborhoods of the city. Right. And as Nero's agents went about buying all the land so that ultimately Nero owned three out of the seven hills of Rome, the Romans began to figure out it was the emperor who set the fire. And when they basically showed up at his house, with you know, skewers and barbecue sauce, hey, Nero like fire, Nero needed a scapegoat. So who did he blame? the Christians. Yeah. And so St. Peter was rounded up with the rest of the Christian community and moved into the only site big enough to hold a public that would witness the execution, the private horse racing circus of Emperor Nero, which is a matter of steps from where I stand, where we're standing. And he was underneath the obelisk, which you now see in the middle of the square where he was crucified upside down. Mm -hmm. And then his body was taken over and thrown into this very simple hole in the ground. What happened after that? And so he was thrown in a pit right over there. What happened next? Well, the Romans made one of the biggest mistakes they're ever going to make. I mean, think about it. The Romans can build a road from here to Russia and 30 mile aqueducts. They don't really make mistakes. They took that body, they threw it into a trench on a hill and covered it with some dirt and covered it with some brick, right. taking out the trash. Right. Wrong. They planted a seed. And the history of the construction of that building is literally watching a seed first flower with the very first monuments they put on Peter's tomb. It was a simple brick wall painted red with a marble altar shoved into it. How do we know? Because someone described it in 200 AD. Really? So we have a description of the first monument on Peter's tomb. Constantine came along in you know, post the legalization of Christianity in 313, and he built a church to Peter enclosing that marble altar into a very sort of a precious little box. Like he mm -hmm. made a reliquary for it. And then he built the church in the same of, in the shape of a cross, keeping Peter's tomb on the crux of that cross. I see. And so that became the first church of St. Peter, which saw everything. It saw, it saw Charlemagne crowned in 800. It saw the first Jubilee year with 200,000 pilgrims, including Dante coming to visit it. It's an amazing church with an amazing history. But by 1506, it was listing off to the side and there were two by fours holding it up in the back, which was okay. probably a bad metaphor for the church. And that's when the construction of that basilica began. Okay. When was it completed? 120 years later. Yeah. This church took 120 years, 12 architects, 20 popes, and the Protestant Reformation to see yeah. it. But there it stands. And yeah. it doesn't look, it makes it all look easy. Yeah does look uh, quite amazing. Church building programs causing conflict are nothing new. And the method used to fund St. Peter's ignited a doctrinal conflict 
that led to a split in the church known as the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, led the protest movement hoping at first to reform the church. But that's a story for another time. Despite the differences, this cathedral reflects the desire that above all, that in all, Jesus is the object of worship. How do people react when you bring them here? Well, I think one of the very first things about the approach to this place, and this is part of the designer, John Lorenzo Bernini was the designer of the square working from 1655 to 1667, and think about it. You're building a square that holds, what, 175,000 people. Uh -huh. uh, how many squares hold 175,000 people in the 17th century? So he's, mm -hmm. he's charting completely new territory and gathering right. people together. And so he has to think about how to bring people together and not terrify them. And so he created this amazing sense of surprise. You walk through a forest of colonnades and then you step into this light. Yeah. And the colonnade doesn't box you in it curves like arms. Right. Yeah. So it brings people in and I think people feel welcome. So in a way, we could say that these are the arms of Peter embracing all people. Arms, yes. It is really the concept of bringing everybody together. That's really cool. In a way, Jesus' parable about a tiny mustard seed growing to full maturity was realized in this man. Peter had been humbled and over time martyred and buried. Only to have this church sprout from the ground as a memorial to the great impact he had. A church in which many people of faith gather and rest in its outstretched arms. Millions have passed by touching the worn bronze feet of Peter, perhaps praying or hoping that moment will sustain or strengthen or renew their faith. My guess is that, like most followers of Jesus, Peter would feel more than a bit uncomfortable receiving all this attention and veneration. Especially if our admiration of Peter detracts somehow from his admiration of Christ. The veneration of Peter is an interesting testimony to God's grace in that, who is this guy Peter? You know, we, we traced him from his roots, a little fishing town in Bethsaida, in Galilee, backwaters of nowhere. And he's a fisherman, he's not educated. He's, he puts his foot in his mouth, he gets things wrong. And yet he becomes one of the most significant figures in the whole of human history. You know, there aren't many historical figures who rival Peter for significance. Number one, indisputably, is Jesus Christ himself. But through Peter's connection to Jesus, Peter becomes enormously significant. From a theological point of view, we see that, well, well God has really powerfully used an ordinary person to do extraordinary things. And that testifies to his power, but also his grace. It's just a gift that God used him the way that he did and blessed so many millions of people throughout 2,000 years through Peter. It's extraordinary. Honestly, I never much went in for studying Peter. It's not that I ignored him, but being a good Protestant, I mostly paid attention to Paul, the prolific New Testament writer and theologian. But I've learned much from this humble man in this pursuit. He's taught me much of my own shortcomings and the grace Jesus has given me. And like Peter, my pursuit isn't really about finding Peter. It's about finding Christ. I think Peter would be happy knowing that the man I discovered starting here in Galilee is indeed a rock, a faithful man 
built, as it were, on the person of Jesus Christ. Take courage, my son, for the Spirit says come and be set free. See you.